We are fortunate to have uh, with us Father Malachi Martin, and we are going to be discussing about the situation in the church today. And uh, perhaps, uh, Father, you can uh, start off by telling us just a little bit about yourself and what you're doing now and what some of your background is. Uh, yes, uh, Bunner, of course. I was born in Ireland uh, 68 years ago. Um, I joined the Jesuits and eventually, after the usual training of 17 years, uh, passing through various European countries and universities, I ended up in Rome as a professor at the Pontifical Biblical Institute. I was trained as a paleographer. Most of our listeners don't know what that is. It's uh, somebody who studies handwriting. And my expertise was in Middle Eastern handwriting about the time of Abraham. But that became a very useful uh, profession for the then Pope John the Twenty Third because he needed contacts with uh, both Arabs and Jews, and I traveled uh, extensively in that area of the Middle East, and that's why I was useful to him. And I got very closely associated with John the Twenty Third and a certain cardinal called Cardinal Augustine Baer. He was the man who was in charge of ecumenism and uh, who traveled extensively in the States during the council. But, but before that time, I had asked my superiors for permission to leave the Jesuits. And um, in 1964, Paul VI, who was then Pope, granted me the permission. He uh, gave me permission to leave the Society of Jesus. And he secularized me. That is, he, I didn't want to be a laicite. I wanted to be secularized. That is, I didn't want to be under a bishop in Cardinal Zina Diocese. I didn't want to belong to a religious order. I didn't want to join Opus Dei. The, the only three alternatives for a clergyman, for a priest in the Catholic Church. So he granted me that and um, gave me a general commission to write uh, and uh, to be active in the field of communication about the Church. And then I went from there to the United States, passing through Paris, and I arrived here on, in uh, just 25 years ago, in January 1965. And uh, from then on I've been writing books and uh, been very engaged in radio and um, television uh, I think I'm known as, probably as a conservative. Um, I, the, we love tags in the United States. Some people would call me a traditionalist. But uh, Bernard, I'm a Catholic. I'm a Catholic priest. And I say my mass every morning. And uh, when permitted by the local bishop, I engage in the usual priestly activities. Um, but my main activity is writing and confessional work and uh, pastoral care of people who, today, in the condition of the church, don't find pastoral care available especially uh, families who are at sixes and sevens about what is happening to them and their children and the public wheel. That's a brief history. Uh, my books sell well. I've had three or four bestsellers. Um, and that's due to the grace of God and not to anything I've written. Could you please uh, tell us a bit about a few of the books you've written that have sold fairly well? The most commonly uh, spoken about one is uh, The Jesuits. That's right. It was because it was the first book published which in cameo outlined what had happened the major orders of the church. In brief, between 1965 and 1975, the major orders of the church, uh, Jesuits, Dominicans, Franciscans, Carmelites, um, literally turned their backs on the papacy and proceeded to follow a line uh, about the church and about the mission of salvation of the church, which is at variance with the traditional Catholic view of life and death and resurrection. I did merely a cameo study of the Jesuits and immediately uh, it was applied to all the other orders. They began to realize that something was extremely rotten in the state of Denmark. That if the Jesuits uh, could have gone like that and they did go like that, then they could explain the, the, the garries of the Franciscans and the horrible corruption of the Dominican order. Um, and all these orders had been the bastions of the church for centuries. And you know, it's a terrible reflection I have, Bernard, that today, what John Paul II needs at the present moment, like he needs air to breathe, he needs a body of men, highly trained, specialists all, in every possible depart uh, department and sector of human life. He needs them internationally established at all the choke points of civilization, Africa, Asia, America, North and South, Canada, the Soviet Union, all the Europe, Western Europe and Central Europe and Scandinavia. He needs them highly centralized. He needs them utterly obedient to the voice of Peter. He needs them utterly devoted to Our Lady and Her Lord. He needs them as priests. And that was the Jesuits. That's exactly what Ignatius has in mind. And today, 
they are not there any longer. Physically, in the sense that they're going down in numbers, you know there are less than 1,000 Jesuits in the United States today. I think in Nancy's father, there were 8,500. And every third man in the missions was a Jesuit. But it's not merely numerically. It is the quality. they literally have declared a silent war on the papacy. Which is an exact reversal of their fourth vow, which is loyalty to the papacy. Obedience. Obedience. Blind obedience was the key note. And that is why they were so valuable to the, to, the, to the Pope, even to the point of permitting him to kill them off in the 18th century for the good of the Church, and then to revive them about 70 years later uh, because he found he needed them. But that was perfect obedience. That's gone. So the Jesuits did create a stir and earned a lot of hatred for me and misunderstanding, except from the older Jesuits and from some of the younger Jesuits who realized that the truth was being told. Now, that was a very good selling book in the sense that it did a lot of good. It did not look good. Um, it did open up uh, what we call in the States a can of worms. It did show what happened. And uh, the, 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 the fact was I had Jesuits writing to me privately anonymously with money to cover 50 copies to be sent to an anonymous address, a P.O.B. box, somewhere because they didn't dare show the book in public. The other book which created a lot of stir was a book called Hostage to the Devil, published in 1975, and it's the only published record of five exorcisms of living Americans. Um, it was based on video and audio tapes because I have been a very active in exorcism all my life. It, um, it was a bestseller here and abroad, and it still is. What it does is this. It proves that any man or woman over 50 who doesn't realize that out in those streets and in those boardrooms and in the boudoirs and in the corporate headquarters and in the army headquarters and the government chanceries, who doesn't realize that Satan is alive and active and happy, that man or woman is a jackass. That is a very difficult uh, concept for the modern mind to grasp because one of the first uh, teachings of the church that has been sort of uh, pushed aside by uh, modern theologians has been a belief in Satan, the devil, and hell. That's right. It's the best PR job ever done. He doesn't exist. He doesn't exist. But please do this. Uh, please kill the babies before they're born. Um, please establish a third way of life. It's human rights. Uh, homosexuals have the same rights as heterosexuals. Uh, please make homosexual marriage all right. Uh, please um, uh, use these contraceptives because then you'll benefit all mankind, we'll limit the population. Um, it doesn't really matter if the pe people in East Timor are being killed off by the Indonesians. It doesn't hurt us. Uh, he's everywhere. He is everywhere. Producing this uh, demand for reason and tolerance and non-fanatic outlook. And every man is his own law. And every conscience is his own guide. This is the best PR going. But the devil, the old figure with uh, horns and a, a dirty tail and yellow eyes and dirty books under his arm, hiding behind the bushes and saying, come over and I'll show you some sin. Oh no, that, that's myth and superstition. It always was. Uh, this is an angelic intelligence, uh, far more potent than any human intelligence could ever be. It's an arch angelic intelligence. And it is engaged in a life-to-death battle with one man who's God. We've got ourselves into a state of affairs, I think, both in the world and the church, where the devil is active and well. And we'll be uh, discussing uh, this situation later on. But to understand how we got there, we have to go back in time to uh, the days of before the Second Vatican Council, when at least everything appeared to be all right in the church. Among uh, conservative uh, people, there is some debate about is that period uh, in the church of the 1950s, let's say, before the Second Vatican Council, was it uh, a very positive period or was it a negative period or what is a bit of both? 
what are, let's say, some of your reflections on that period of history, just shortly before the Second Vatican Council? Well, we can take this, Bernard, we can take this from a purely what they call historical point of view today, which is the second earth point of view. And you can say, well, there was this teacher who was a bit wonky in his theology, and there was this movement in the 30s about the liturgy which the Pope had to suppress, 